Hi, I'm Tom Felmer with the Cedarburg Art Museum. When I joined the Board of Directors, um, I was asked if I would lead the, it was just referred to then as the book project. Um, of course, I didn't know what I was getting into, uh, but now two years later, it's really been a phenomenal project. Okay, what makes this book truly amazing is it's the, the first book of its kind. Uh, the book covers 13,000 years of Wisconsin art history. Now, to be fair, the first 12,600 years are covered in the first chapter, uh, but still, it's amazing. It covers the entire history of, of art that's taken place in Wisconsin from the first indigenous people um, through the year 2000. What's also unique about the book is it's really, there's something in it for everyone. If you're true, if you're an art historian, um, it, you know, it's a, it's a scholarly book, it's highly researched. Um, if you just like, if you're just someone who loves art, um, there are over 400 images in the book it's, uh, it's beautif beautifully designed, uh, the designer of the book. Uh, Jenna Scher has designed literally hundreds of books for uh, museums um, around the country, and it's, uh, it's truly as beautiful. And for those of you who are just interested in all things Wisconsin, it's really interesting to follow the history of Wisconsin and, and learn about all of the incredible artists um, that we've had uh, come from our state. And the title of the book is A Creative Place, The History of Wisconsin Art. And you truly do see after looking through this 400 plus page book that Wisconsin is home to many creative people. One of the other things that I really like about the book is that the book was written by people um, that were based in Wisconsin. We had the designers from Wisconsin, the editors, um, the proofreaders, the, everybody that's been involved with the book is from Wisconsin. And the book was also printed by Quad Graphics, which is another great Wisconsin company. So this book is, is all about Wisconsin. And while we've had input from literally thousands of sources for this book, the two primary authors have been Tom Lidke and Anne-Marie Sawkins. So Tom was previously the director of the Museum of Wisconsin Art. He's an, he's an artist and uh, he's been very active in the Wisconsin art scene for, for many, many years. And Anne-Marie Sawkins has a PhD in art history from McGill University in Quebec, Canada. Uh, she was a curator at the Haggerty Museum and she's a, a, an art consultant and has uh, an immense amount of knowledge in Wisconsin art history as well. So next you'll be hearing from Tom and Anne Marie. Uh, they've done an amazing job at, in creating this book and I hope you enjoy what they have to say. Um, when we were transitioning the Museum of Wisconsin Art from a, region, a, a local uh, art museum to uh, the Museum of Wisconsin Art, uh, we, were, we began gathering information, um, learning as we went along, um, trying to pick up as much uh, as we could, uh, gathering material and research. Uh, and as we were uh, weaving our way through, we realized that uh, there was so much out there to, to learn, so much that we didn't know. And there was no single source that was providing everything that we really needed. And there were people who were interested after we announced what we were doing in learning more. So um, I began teaching a, a graduate course, as I mentioned earlier, uh, in Wisconsin art history. I taught it at the Museum of Wisconsin Art. And when we began the course, I was handing out three ring binders full of photocopies because there was no single source. I lamented the fact that there was no single source and dreamt of the day that were, perhaps somebody would write a book on Wisconsin art history that could be used for the course but would also be approachable by the general public. So uh, as the Museum of Wisconsin Art grew and began planning for uh, a new facility, which was a nine-year process by the time the doors were opened. Uh, the workload there got larger and larger, and I, the, the dream of a art history book uh, got farther and farther away until finally um, I retired in 2013. <clears throat> but what happened at that time uh, was I began to think more about the book and began to uh, think about how important this was. And it was about at that time that um, I met uh, Mel Hepburn, whose dream it was, was to uh, create the Cedarburg Art Museum and uh, began working with uh, Mel and doing a, a little bit of advising uh, with him uh, and discussions with him about that. 
And I approached him uh, about the possibility and, and wondered if uh, they, this new Cedarburg Art Museum, uh, which started in 2013, would be interested in uh, doing that. And uh, I think it was about uh, 2015 that uh, we finalized the idea that maybe this would be a good thing for the Cedarburg Art Museum to do. And uh, Mel, being a visionary, latched onto it and said, let's do it. Let's, let's move forward. Basically, I outlined uh, the chapters and the main themes for the chapters. And from that point, then we began to build the team. And uh, it was such an enormous project that it did require a team of many people. Um, we had four writers, um, uh, three, three chapter writers, but four writers. We had research associates. We have two editors. We have a book designer, an indexer, um, research associates who worked on a myriad of, of different things. And this included uh, many uh, people from the Cedarburg Art Museum who uh, stepped up to help uh, do project management, uh, marketing. Um, it was uh, uh, an orchestration of many talented individuals. Um, and that takes time too. So that entered into the five-year time frame. This actually was attempted in 1936 in the groundbreaking book done by Porter Butts art in Wisconsin. So uh, 1936 is a long time ago and a lot of history has transpired since then and the understanding and study of art history has changed significantly. So it was long overdue that we had a book like this uh, created here in Wisconsin about Wisconsin art. Um, so it's, it's a, a, a big step. Um, we approach the book in a way that we think uh, works for all types of readers, whether they're interested in Wisconsin history, interested in Wisconsin art history, um, whether they uh, are academically trained in the history of art, or whether uh, they have a general uh, background in, in learning and in ed education. Um, we weave together some narratives and some stories that uh, provide some social political background for the artwork that's created. Uh, but we also go uh, and cite specific uh, art history references that an art historian uh, might, might be interested or would be interested in. So we really do approach this in a, a general way to try to uh, engage all readers. We discovered uh, many things that the entire state can be excited about. We discovered artwork in uh, Superior, Wisconsin, that was worthy of including uh, Esther Bubbly, the World War II photographer uh, who served uh, uh, admirably. Uh, there were artists from uh, Beloit to Door County uh, who uh, were sadly neglected um, uh, that were covering their work. Um, a lot of people focus uh, their attention on the metro regions, uh, the Madison, Milwaukee, and the Fox Valley, and rightly so, because their population base is higher. But there's a lot of very important and interesting art that was produced all over the state. And we uh, took care in trying to uncover this and ourselves discovered some very amazing things that I think everybody uh, is going to really find interesting. Um, one of the earliest uh, nationally known, actually internationally known artists who spent time in Wisconsin um, working here is uh, George Catlin. And George Catlin is internationally known as the um, North American Indian painter. Went all over creating uh, and capturing uh, Native American history in a photorealist way of, of painting uh, these portraits and life with Native Americans. But uh, what's interesting in the book is uh, the illustrations that uh, Catlin did of uh, Native American life in Prairie du Chien. Um, Prairie du Chien was at one time the largest city in Wisconsin, and that's not saying a lot because the white population in Prairie du Chien at that time was maybe about 50 or 60 people. However, this area of Prairie du Chien was a rendezvous area for 
uh, Midwestern Native Americans uh, to gather for uh, the hunt, for the buffalo hunt, uh, to carry meat back home, to uh, trade goods, uh, to sell furs to the uh, French fur traders. Um, so George Catlin visually recorded uh, this, and one of the images in the book is a ball play, the game of lacrosse, by thousands of women. The women had their game, and the men had their games, and it was kind of a free-for-all where anybody who wanted to join in on the game can. It didn't, you didn't have to limit the amount of players. Uh, you, didn't, you could play it with a few. You could play it with thousands. So Catlin uh, illustrated the thousands of women playing in this one uh, game. So this is just one example of um, how George Catlin captured a piece of our history, um, which is of national importance. And then, of course, we segue into the history of Prairie du Chien, which was uh, a fascinating history um, with the forts that were occupied by the Americans, then took over by the British. Then uh, the Americans took over and uh, burnt the fort before uh, they left. And there is another uh, British uh, portrait in there of the commander of the British fort uh, who was saying farewell to his Native American troops that were uh, sided with, with the British. Um, so Captain Bulger uh, speaking to his uh, troops as he's leaving was done uh, by, uh, photo, uh, painted by Peter Reindersbacher the first uh, professional artist in Wisconsin, actually, who s spent time here and stayed here, as opposed to the itinerant artists like Catlin, who came through. Uh, an artist from Menominee, uh, Wisconsin. Um, he uh, was part of the failed German Revolution of 1848, settled in Wisconsin as a, a refugee, um, and uh, did a, a marvelous uh, Civil War painting for a Civil War hero uh, up in Menominee. Um, it's a great painting of a Civil War naval battle scene at night. Um, it resides in the Mabel Tanter Theater in Menominee, Wisconsin. And this was just an amazing discovery. Um, it's not only a, a great work of art, a beautiful work of art, um, but it is historically important, and so is the life of this artist important. He, we tell his story about how he escaped from Germany uh, and how he settled in Wisconsin. And speaking of the failed German Revolution of 1848, we speak about that because it had a huge impact on art in Wisconsin. Um, at the time of the failed German Revolution, 3,000 of these revolutionaries moved uh, to Wisconsin and settled in a state of 200,000 people. These were well-educated revolutionary people who had a fair amount of financial means and they wanted to create a democracy in um, uh, Germany from the monarchy. Uh, that all failed and they wanted to uh, move to some place where they could uh, enjoy uh, democracy, but they pushed our democracy even farther. And they helped create the first kindergarten in the United States, which was in Watertown. And they had other deep-rooted democratic principles that Wisconsin slowly began to uh, adapt, which uh, were called too liberal at the time. But they had a huge impact on our social uh, policies of the late 19th century, mid to late 19th century. And they were the first wave of German immigrants which helped create a fertile bed for the German artists who settled in Wisconsin during the last half of the uh, 19th century. We had over 50 uh, Wisconsin artists who either studied at the German academies and then moved to uh, Wisconsin or were first generation Wisconsin born and studied at the German art academies. So Milwaukee in particular and Munich are joined at the hip uh, because of the Royal Academy of Fine Arts in Munich, but not only that one, the one in Dusseldorf, the one in Weimar, the one in Berlin. Um, our artists were tied closely to uh, Germany until uh, World War I, and that's when uh, we pretty much uh, split. And it wasn't because necessarily of the war, it was also because uh, the United States 
artists of the United States began to break away from uh, the European ideals, and that's when American regionalism began uh, to surface, and that was our own first American-born uh, art movement, which works hand-in-hand -hand with uh, jazz, the first American, uh, international American-born uh, music form. The American Impressionist, who worked with the French Impressionist, uh, who was actually good friends with Monet, Theodore Robinson from Delafield, Wisconsin. Uh, he's one that uh, we can be proud who came from Wisconsin. H.H. Uh, Bennett, who is the photographer of the Wisconsin Dells, um, who was discovered on the East Coast um, probably about two decades ago. Uh, his work is, is stunning, and we're glad to have that in the book. John Stuart Curry, uh, one of the three chief American uh, regionalist artists, settled in Madison and uh, did wonderful things, helped cr create uh, the rural arts or worked with the rural arts program, which was very unique to Wisconsin in helping to get um, art throughout the small communities of Wisconsin, a very democratic uh, approach to art, um, which uh, occurred during the Great Depression era. Um, so Wisconsin is known for that. Uh, the famed American photographer Edward Steichen uh, came from Wisconsin. Uh, George O'Keefe, of course, uh, came from Wisconsin. Um, everybody assumed, uh, well, people who know her well, uh, uh, claim that she left Wisconsin and never came back, but that's, we found out, is not true. She did come back at least once or twice and painted with her sisters who were artists who very few people are aware of until just recently in the last five years that's been uh, brought out and uncovered. So that's an interesting part of our story. Uh, the American art glass movement, everybody seems to love uh, hand-blown art glass, studio glass it's called. Well, uh, everybody who has done that in the United States can tra trace their lineage back to Madison, Wisconsin, 1962, Harvey Littleton. That was the uh, beginning of uh, glass blowing in the United States and actually throughout the world. But to the lesser known artists, the 19th century panorama painters, um, there's not a lot known about that. We talk uh, about that. And I hate to say this, but uh, lesser known includes women artists, who, who many of whom uh, the readers will read the major, major accomplishments that they did that were never recognized. So this is all new. Uh, it's not less. It's amazingly new, but uh, it, 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 we do bring all, all of that out. Um, and we talk about people like uh, James Schwalbach, um, who taught art by radio during this era of democratic art. Uh, during the uh, Great Depression, um, he was teaching art on radio, which seems strange, but uh, it actually was ex extremely effective. Um, and he taught art in four different states to over a million people, children, over the radio. Um, oh, from the time frame of 1936 to I think it was 1972, his program was was on, and it received a great boost when um, the Great Depression uh, wanted to uh, democratize everything so that uh, people were employed, but so that it was in a beneficial way to help uh, a lot of people. So uh, rural electrification was one way that the government could uh, do this. And uh, that simply means that uh, the government forced the utility companies to provide electricity throughout all the rural areas that wasn't as profitable as the city areas. And basically they were told, if, if you're going to uh, produce electricity, it has to be for everybody. So that allowed the rural schools and the small community schools to have a radio because radios required electricity, a plug-in, right? So then all of a sudden, 
these schools and these rural areas that couldn't afford a teacher could now at least listen to somebody from the University of Wisconsin-Madison teach about art. And uh, quite often, uh, teachers of art, and I was one myself at one time, would uh, hold up examples of what they were talking about and trying to teach. And then when it was time for the children to, uh, to make their example, they would frequently make their variation of what the teacher thought was good. What James Schwabach did was talk about certain imagery and ideas, and he would then tie it together with uh, sound and music, like a lyrical flow. Uh, and they, they would talk about the lyrical flow of music or uh, some other uh, verbal uh, uh, command or, or suggestion of, of what was going on. And then it was up to the child to interpret it in what, their own way. And that's really what creativity is all about anyway. So it wasn't as crazy as I first thought uh, to teach by radio. It was, it was a smart way. So that was a very unique part of uh, American art history during the Great Depression, which was democratic in small d where um, the government provided jobs for artists, used artists to create public art. More public art was created during the Great Depression than any other time in American history. And uh, art was used to employ people. Um, Elsa Albrecht was an artist in Milwaukee who uh, was hired uh, by the WPA era programs, the Milwaukee Handicraft Project, to create artwork for public institutions. And um, her program was so successful that it employed 5,000 people to create art that was sent to schools and institutions. One of the institutions was uh, the Home for uh, Homeless Children, or people who couldn't take care of their children, or people who had passed away and their children were orphaned. Uh, there was an institution that had 600 of these children, and they were uh, living in very sterile conditions. And also, all Bricks program decided they were going to change that. What they did was they, they made dolls, and they made toys, they made handmade books, they made quilts, uh, uh, coverlets for their beds and their cots. Um, so they, they helped create a home environment. Now that was just one example of the products and where they went. Some of them went to universities, uh, uh, libraries, some of them went to post offices. All of this artwork that was created during the Great Depression and these programs, and it wasn't just a Milwaukee program. Uh, one was up in Lac du Flambeau for the Native Americans. Um, so uh, this was just a unique uh, part of our, our art history that's set apart from all of the rest of the history. The, uh, I, th I think what I uh, accomplished was to help a lot of people come together and create a team of individuals who did justice to the history of Wisconsin art to date. Um, it's, it's a huge task. There were so many people who had uh, pertinent information, important information, uh, who helped enrich the whole uh, story of Wisconsin art, um, content readers, researchers, uh, to be able to work with all of these people and to help pull their uh, material together uh, almost uh, like an orchestra conductor pulling uh, all of the talent together and heading it in in one direction. Uh, whether we succeeded or not, I'll leave it up to the readers, but um, I think that that was uh, part of my goal and my mission was to uh, help draw all of this material together and bring it out and present it to the uh, public and uh, help uh, the general public become aware of how rich our visual art history is in our state of Wisconsin. Well, first of all, there are not a lot of books on the history of a state's uh, art 
our visual arts um, scene. And so this is a, the book was a really unique uh, and major undertaking. One of the things that I sought to do with this project was really to connect what was happening in Wisconsin into the broader context of what was happening nationwide. And so this doesn't become a book just about Wisconsin or for Wisconsin. I really think that it can serve as a model to other um, writers, art historians, who wish to look at the art in their state. Uh, so that said, I really am thinking of a wider audience for this book. It will also show how Wisconsin artists were working in a variety of mediums and therefore could be included into the broader national conversation. And so I think this is what is, this is one point that Wisconsinites can be quite proud of is that their, their state and the artists in the state really are um, thinking about broader questions and um, acting creatively, not just locally, but really uh, nationwide. People interested in history will also really enjoy this book because not only will they learn about the post-war period, the tremulent 60s, um, the cultural wars of the 80s, and um, sort of modern day construction in new museums, um, they'll be able to see this in a context that relates to the visual arts. And I think that'll be a new dimension for a, a number of people interested in history, and particularly in uh, Wisconsin's history. People are also going to really enjoy the explosion of art mediums that takes place, um, po again, post-World War II. Um, artists just become really creative with materials, and, and that's something very fun to see. Uh, Wisconsin also is home to an incredible collection of artist-built environments. Uh, these are creative people um, with ideas that they just run with. and. Um, there's a lot of sites in and around Wisconsin that people can visit to see uh, these places, um, a lot of which, uh, many of which have been preserved by the Kohler Foundation, a fantastic institution that really is advancing Wisconsin art on a daily basis in a national context. Some things I'm particularly proud of is coming up with the title of the book uh, because Wisconsin truly is a creative place. Three people in particular who I brought to the project who deserve recognition are Wendy Greenhouse from Chicago, an art historian, Melanie Herzog, uh, art historian um, from Madison, and Jenna Shear, the designer of the book. These three women did a fantastic job, really um, heartfelt contributions and um, applied their expertise in every instance. The editor of our book came to my attention through the research that I was doing. She was important to this project, not only as an art historian and as somebody with superior research abilities, but also as someone who could edit the book and could see what we were trying to do and pull it together in, 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 a, in a most elegant and um, scholarly way. I also worked with curators. Um, as a member of the Association of Art Museum Curators, I was able to draw on scholars from across the country who have expertise in, in different areas in order to make sure that the text that, and the work that we were doing really does mesh with um, the expertise that is out in the community. So the book is organized uh, chronologically and thematically. Um, and But it's not necessarily meant to be read cover to cover, it certainly can be, but people are free to jump from section to section, and we hope that the book serves as a reference and also um, an elegant book for people to share. It's full of images and um, really should generate a lot of conversation about art in Wisconsin. For the book, I was responsible for chapters 5, 6, and 7. These are the chapters that cover the essentially the post-war period of Wisconsin art uh, through to the year 2000. And it's really during this time that there's a huge flourishing and blossoming of art um, in, in part because of the return of veterans from the war, but also because the UW systems really grew exponentially with um, more programs and um, more classes for artists of all ages, or students and artists of all ages. A very common question about the book 
is what constitutes a Wisconsin artist. And for me, as an author, art historian, and researcher on this project, I really thought about who were the people, particularly post-war, who made a difference, who con contributed to the art scene in Wisconsin, whether they were born in Wisconsin, educated in, in Wisconsin, or just in Wisconsin for a period of time. It was really the art scene that I was interested in, and then how that art scene related to the national art scene. In some instances, there was a direct connection, and Wisconsin artists were really contributing to what was going on and what was part of the um, sort of avant-garde conversation about art. In the book, we really consider the whole range of visual arts mediums that were um, employed in the state of Wisconsin. Um, and there is really a huge expansion of um, creative approaches to, to mediums post-World War II. And this was very exciting to see the way Wisconsin artists took something like fibers or printmaking and really expanded their potential uh, inter, um, moving them into sculpture, sculptural forms, being multimedia, being super creative in uh, with installations and with all matter of multimedia, time-based and even technology-based art. Part of the book also deals with the whole marriage or confluence of art and craft because there's important moments, say in mid-century, where artists really started drawing processes from the craft world and introducing them into their work. And craft artists, in turn, also were creating more monumental pieces that were worthy of um, inclusion in museum exhibitions. So there's a real conversation going on about crafts, about um, women's work, about creativity, about the potential of various mediums, and it's really exciting to see that in the book. So our book has many of the artists you would expect, but also I think artists that people may not recognize as having um, been part of the important dialogue about art. There are expansive discussions on folk art, on the crafts, on artist-built environments, and we have many to be very proud of in the state of Wisconsin. You asked me about women artists in the book, and uh, that was one of the most exciting aspects of the research for this book, was really learning about the number of women artists and how they have just super excelled in um, the visual arts in Wisconsin um, throughout its history, but particularly during the more modern era. Um, artists that I particularly think are noteworthy and ought to receive even more attention um, further on are artists like Lucia Stern. Uh, she was creative. She had a national and um, even international reputation um, showing her work in Paris and in New York. Um, she's an artist that was working in both two-dimensionally and three-dimensionally introducing um, new mediums, new forms within her collaged work. Um, and it was really thanks to um, descendants and collectors of her work that I was able to fill out the story about Lucia Stern for the book. An artist I particularly enjoyed learning more about is uh, Jean Stamsta. She was a Sheboygan native and uh, she was really at the forefront of a creative new direction with her conceptual uh, approach to fiber. She literally took textiles off the wall and created freestanding sculptures um, that really upended the whole idea of weavings as two-dimensional, flat, and functional. So um, really in creating three-dimensional sculpture, she uh, revolutionized um, the fiber movement. And there were other artists um, who did similar creative things um, in textiles. And so Milwaukee or Wisconsin really had a moment um, when it came to um, fibers and textile. There were also people I discovered such as Dorothy Provis, who um, was not only innovative in sculpture and faux furs, uh, faux fur as a cover material, but also in passing legislations or laws that really supported the rights of, of artists and made them a priority in business and commercial situations. And on another artist I would be remiss not to mention is Marjorie Kralik, a sculptor and mosaic artist 
who um, was working on major projects uh, across the state. She's responsible for the, moex, the mosaics that appear in the state building in uh, Milwaukee, which unfortunately is currently threatened with demolition. But she worked in Italy. She crafted major mosaics. Um, women in general often struggled to get the recognition that they deserve um, in art departments. Um, they struggled to, to be the focus of exhibitions. They were not always the major um, subject of publication. So there was a lot of redressing of um, the imbalance that characterizes the art history world. Um, so this publication, I hope, will be a first and important step towards recognizing artists that really, really deserve recognition. And oftentimes they're, they're women artists who um, were not written about or were not given the space and the opportunity to, um, to shine. There was a real gender bias um, that characterized our history and also um, a you know, racial bias and I hope that we are moving towards a more equitable society and recognizing talents where, where they exist. Through interviews I also was able to include a richer and more complete profile, a not, a, not a definitive one, but more information on African American artists, particularly in the Milwaukee area. And this is a cadre of artists who really were uh, exhibiting on a regular basis in um, galleries such as the Gallery Towards the, the Black Aesthetic and D Gallery, um, venues that were very important to the community and have um, had an impact in Milwaukee. Um, many Wisconsinites may be familiar with the Magic Realists, a fantastic group of artists who coalesced in Madison around uh, Marshall Glazier, Glazier um, and really were very innovative in their approach to art, creating art that's had a lasting impact um, in the history of Wisconsin. Um, this is a, a, a moment in, in the history of Wisconsin art that many people can be quite proud of. Um, surrealism as a, as a sort of theme or style in art has always had much traction with artists and with collectors and people in general. The artists in the Magic Realist group included, as I said, Marshall Glazier, um, Sylvia Fine, John Wilde, uh, Dudley Hupler. Um, these artists really created a coterie and it was an important moment in, in, in history for Madison and for um, the art world. In the later chapters of the book, there's particular attention paid to the UW system. The UW system of universities was really quite proactive and um, successful in identifying um, prominent artists across the country and then um, offering them positions at the, at the various universities. And it was really these professional artists as professors slash artists who really made a difference to the education of art in Wisconsin. Um, and this is a major focus of the later chapters of the book. Um, they really invigorated the art scene in um, Wisconsin and um, contributed to the learning of generations of artists. Um, so you'll see real important artists in the book teaching future generations and then creating a kind of continuity in, um, in the state. A creative place was really broad in its ambitions. We wanted to look at artists, artistic mediums, educational institutions, museums, galleries, arts organizations, and the broader context of cultural art in Wisconsin. So it was an enormous undertaking, and uh, we hope that we have provided a nice and broad and informative survey um, that people will be proud of. A creative place is also not the last word on art in Wisconsin. Certainly, um, the community continues to be very, very creative. Uh, and so hopefully this book will spawn new studies and new articles and, and, and exhibitions that highlight works uh, by the artists in the book, because many of them deserve much more attention, particularly, I would say, uh, some of the women artists.
and some of the artists of color. One of the things that I'm most proud of is really pushing this book and this project from being a more localized story about art in Wisconsin to really an academic and scholarly publication. And this I was able to do in part by pulling in other experts and art historians. Um, and I think that it, it can't be said too much that it really took a village to put this together. And so I want to thank everybody who was involved and um, to let people know that um, it's something that we can all be proud of. And it really is a book for and about Wisconsin, but hopefully something, a book that will go beyond the state and really be recognized nationwide. I'd also like to say that I'm most proud and happy about the friendships that I made along the way. Uh, as I said earlier, I worked with artists, I worked with photographers, I worked with collectors, curators, museum professionals, um, people in galleries, people shared their collections, people shared their archives with me. Um, and I met some fantastic people along the way. And it's really those people that I will cherish for the rest of my life.